so this is week 9 discussion okay and in this week we will so we have something interesting to discuss this week because uh, most of the content uh, for the week 9 was mostly theory and then a paper discussion so i will request you guys to go through the paper on your own read the paper read the methodology i will just briefly discuss uh, what was given in the paper and uh, then we'll see an example of uh, deep learning in collab uh, online uh, lab notebook jupiter notebook so as i promised that uh, if we have a theory class purely theory class uh, in that case we'll do that so today we'll try to cover that so let's start with the theory first and then we'll come to the in the end we'll discuss about the uh, deep learning okay so in this week we discuss about the importance of the application of hyper spectral remote sensing in agriculture so what is hyper hyper spectral if you recall when we discussed about diffused reflectance spectroscopy then we talked about some of the uh, spectral signatures or some of the spectral schemes that we have and that we commonly see in the data those were if you recall then uh, it is better otherwise i will i am writing here uh, those were panchromatic multispectral then hyperspectral and then uh, the most sophisticated or most fine ultra spectral so when we talk about panchromatic if you remember then uh, it is one band that is very wide so let's say whole visible so if you look at this uh, electromagnetic spectrum then uh, the whole visible uh, uh, wavelength is covered in one band itself so we have uh, let's say we go from uh, visible to infrared and then uh, more higher and higher wavelength and in this case in case of uh, panchromatic the red let's say the blue uh, part of the visible radiation will be in one band the green will be in one band red will be in one band then you have an ir in one band and so on so this is not very nice uh, not very helpful for us because we have invisible from 400 nanometer wavelength to 700 nanometer and you are just dividing it into three so as we know by now that uh, the reflectance or the absorbance of any kind of electromagnetic wave it varies with the wavelength so you you are kind of uh, averaging out if we are uh, limiting ourselves to less number of bands so then multi spectral bands came where uh, we had uh, 5 to 10 let's say bands and uh, the they covered from uh, 70 i feel, i remember if i remember correctly 70 uh, 70 nanometer to 400 nanometer uh, yeah thank you so then we had uh, instead of one band we had uh, 5 to 10 bands with width of each uh, with some width of each band and they were covered from uh, they uh, it was from 70 nanometer to 400 nanometer the band width can vary from uh, this to this then we have hyperspectral where we have uh, 100 to 200 bands 
So uh, same electromagnetic spectrum that we talked about, it is divided into like uh, some range of the electromagnetic spectrum. It is divided into five to ten bands in multispectral, and the hundred to two hundred bands in your hyperspectral, where the each band thickness varies from five to ten nanometer. Then, if we want to go even finer, then there is uh, ultra spectral, right? Then there may be like thousands of bands, but we don't need to worry about that. We'll discuss about hyperspectral remote sensing. Okay, so this uh, let's visualize this spectral resolution that I am talking about. That we have uh, ten uh, one band uh, width is five to ten m uh, new. Nanometer, and uh, in case of hyperspectral, so what does that mean? That means that if you draw a plot of uh, the intensity of the reflectance absorbed or represented in a pixel, then you will have, if we have a reflectance on the y-axis and then a wavelength on the x-axis, then instead of having instead of having a uh, like averaged out kind of uh, value plot that you will get in case of uh, multispectral let's say like this is uh, 70 nanometer right or, and so you have like an average reflectance in 70 nanometer wavelength band instead of like having a this kind of reflectance you will have a finer and much more informative reflectance so that will be that may go something like this. So when you averaged out this, you missed this pattern. You averaged out here, you maybe you missed this pattern, this pattern. So it gives us more information when we have uh, more number of bands and the bands are, uh, you know, thinner. So spectral resolution, you can say that uh, it's proportional to the width of the bands and uh, at the same time number of bands also you cannot have just one band very fine you need to have number of bands that are thin okay so uh, how do we use this how do we use this reflectance value that we get from a hyperspectral spectroscopy so as i plotted this here we'll just plot it again and i will try to explain see the thing is this uh, absorbance of the electromagnetic wave and uh, this reflectance from any surface it is governed by the chemical bonds that exist within that particular uh, material that uh, is reflecting the light so when you look at uh, so let me write here reflectance and then wavelength on the x-axis so when you look at vegetation for example then you will have something like this that what what i draw i had drawn earlier and you will see that the peak reflectance that is here this is observed not the whole thing but this is observed in near infrared range of the wavelength so this is for vegetation and if you talk about soil then soil will have a curve something like this where the maximum reflectance will occur in your intermediate infrared so if we if we can distinguish these uh, vegetation and the soil based on their reflectance and we can somehow plot it and get the value of the uh, from an image of how many pixels are having reflectance high in the in intermediate infrared or how many are having high in the near infrared, we can kind of quantify that how much 
vegetation land or how much barren land just with soil exists in a particular area. So that is uh, one of the very simple example of how it can be used. Okay, so then let's just discuss, let's just see uh, what are some of the very fundamental differences uh, between multispectrals uh, and uh, hyperspectral spectroscopy. So I will, uh, I will want, I will hope that uh, some of you can, you know, participate and tell me. So what is the difference that uh, you think like based on our discussion that we just had what do you think is the difference that comes out to your mind just pops it uh, when we say hyperspectral and multispectral you can unmute your mic you can say or you can type in a chat or whatever you feel like Okay, so as we just discussed, so the most obvious difference is the number of bands. The divisions of the electromagnetic spectrum in multispectral and hyperspectral. That is one of the very apparent differences uh, between these two. So this is a less in case of multispectral and more in case of hyperspectral. Okay. So there is a, uh, I, I don't think it was uh, mentioned very clearly, but the thing is, when you have this, these many bands, when you have this much information for a particular region, it takes a lot of time to gather that or to store that information. So usually these, uh, hyperspectral sensors or the hyperspectral satellites that you, if you say they have a very low temporal resolution. So they, if they revolve around the earth, let's say a satellite is uh, revolving around our earth. So the frequency of the satellite, which is having less number of bands uh, reaching the same point. So this is the earth and then the frequency with which this satellite will revisit this point on the earth will be more in case of multispectral and less in case of hyperspectral because we want to capture more data so uh, you can even say that hyperspectral uh, satellites are um, can often be observed in some kind of geosynchronous uh, satellites what is geosynchronous satellites if these are the satellites that remain stationary with respect to earth's point uh, always so they their rotation speed is same as the revolving uh, speed of the earth around its axis so you can uh, say something like this so they have basically less temporal resolution and also they have less spatial resolution because they uh, need to cover so much detail because uh, because of memory constraint or let's say because of their slow movement constraint or geosynchronous constraint they don't cover a huge area of uh, earth in the hyperspectral spectroscopy so they have a higher temporal resolution and they have higher spatial resolution the multispectral spectrum Okay, so some these are some of the basic things and then in the slides if you see you will see some of the examples for the uh, sensors or the satellites that do this uh, kind of uh, multispectral and hyperspectral spectrum. Okay, now uh, I wanted to discuss something about yeah, so when we say uh, if you have gone through the slides, you will see that uh, the spatial resolution of some, some of the satellites that were discussed in the class, it was given in the form of 30 meter or let me check exactly. Uh, so ECO, IO, uh, EO1 Hyperion, it was given as uh, 30 meter, yeah. 
and then hiko it was given as uh, 90 meter so what do we understand by this uh, what do you understand by this 30 meter spatial resolution anyone whatever you think uh, you can say okay so let me explain so uh, you remember that i said that uh, maybe not okay just a minute yeah so you remember that i said that this spectroscopy is basically taking the images and storing the values of the reflectance in each pixel now we cannot have in an image we have some defined number of pixels some in a finite number of pixels but the points on the ground if you just talk about the points not even in the ground let's say even in an area they are infinite right so there has to be some kind of averaging when we are storing the data into the pixels so that is uh, that is what is said by the spatial resolution so the one pixel of your hyperspectral image is going to average out the reflectance of a ground area that is 30 meter by 30 meter in case of uh, io eo1 hyperio and just imagine Uh, some satellites uh, if you uh, recall from the slides some were even having a 500 meter uh, spatial uh, resolution so that would mean that if you go uh, like a whole uh, football field right a whole football uh, football field is giving only one reflectance value so this is also one of the reasons that uh, spatial resolution is of importance because let's say you have a, a small uh, where, like this is a football field and you have some small kind of uh, different object here some mirror here and this is a big football field so the reflectance value will be kind of between uh, the the thing that will be given by the grass and then the the mirror so it won't be able to distinguish that what is exactly at this point right and in ocean when we talk about uh, spectroscopy in ocean then it is actually advised to have a higher uh, spatial uh, or a lower spatial resolution because nothing much is going on uh, in the ocean there is not much variation to cover in the ocean so if you have lower spatial resolution like 500 meters that we will see uh, that is fine for that kind of uh, study okay so why i went there is uh, this uh, okay so when you want to detect any object through reflectance in a hyperspectro uh, sorry <laughs> hyperspectral spectroscopy it's uh, very weird for me to say this so it depends actually on some some things that, that i will list it depends on the spatial coverage of material so if my resolution is 30 meter by 30 meter and in between i have on the ground one plant then you won't be able to get a very good signal for uh, that particular plant if you want so there needs to be uh, like big area there needs to be like this whole thing or most of this 30 meter by 30 meter area needs to be covered by vegetation for us to be getting a reliable signal that yes there is a vegetation in this particular location in the ground shown by this particular pixel then signal to noise ratio also like there should be a, a homogeneity kind of there cannot be a, some different uh, 
so they cannot be two different kind of vegetations if you are looking to uh, get the maize uh, plant distinguish maize plants then it cannot be like one we have maize plant one we have soybean plant and then some other plant that will increase the noise you won't be able to clearly identify the desired or the area of interest and the strength of absorption of material so if signal oh, let me write a signal to noise strength of absorption of material so if it is absorbing all the radiation given to it and it's not reflecting anything then it is very hard to uh, you know map that in a uh, reflectance spectroscopy okay so these these were the basics of uh, how the hyperspectral spectroscopy now let's go and look at some of the satellites and their specific specifications so as i said we have uh, eo1 hyperion i don't think you need to memorize these things but uh, i will just quickly list out these things and uh, we'll go to the next exercise so this satellite was commissioned from 2000 to 2017 and it had 220 spectral bands so is this multi spectral spectroscopy or hyper spectral spectroscopy what do you think option a multi option b hyper or option C uh, what was it ultra so what do you guys think a B or C okay so we don't have a very interacting audience today so it is hyper spectral spectroscopy so we did we saw that it was uh, the number of bands in a hyperspectral spectroscopy varies from 100 to 200 so it can be 210 also the wave uh, the width of each band was around uh, 10 nanometer spatial resolution covered by this satellite each pixel is 30 meter by 30 meter on the ground and the swath is 775 kilometers so what is this swath so when you have a satellite, let's say this satellite is going, this is our Earth, and this satellite is going around in this orbit. And then it is projecting, uh, capturing an image. So the image, if you look at, if you just combine the image, then what you will see, that this will be the area covered by the satellite, right? and this direction is along the movement of the satellite so this perpendicular to the movement of the satellite the distance it covers it is referred to as swap okay yeah and is there something i'm missing yeah so this uh, 350 the wavelength uh, band the range of the electromagnetic spectrum that this uh, satellite covered was from 357 nanometer to 2567 nanometer so that's all about this uh, eo1 hybrid now let's talk about something that you would have often seen if you have seen any remote sensing paper any paper that uh, that shows uh, uh, reflectance spectroscopy that is false color composite so why do we uh, what is this false color composite first of all so the thing is when you see this uh, spectroscopy results the reflectance results in the computer or in a system when you represent it 
then you represent the ref, uh, the reflectance intensity you tell the system that see this is my one pixel it has this much reflectance for red this much reflectance for blue and this much reflectance for green and based on that as i have uh, discussed very often in this session that uh, the screen that you are currently seeing right now is also made up of different intensities of red blue and green light so to visualize this hyper uh, the spectral images into your system you tell your uh, map or the software to show this many variations of intensities for the red blue and green respectively now when the light in question when you are actually sending only the red blue and green lights then it is fine you can show the their corresponding reflectance in their corresponding slot but we also send a lot of radiations a lot of uh, electromagnetic waves that are outside the visible range that are outside like near infrared right like uh, medium uh, intermediate infrared short wave long wave so then in that case how do we represent the reflectance of these uh, electromagnetic waves because we cannot see them we cannot see infrared light so what we do is we get the reflectance value of uh, the let's say near infrared let's say this is r4 and we put it into the red uh, pixel so we say now you light my red pixel by the amount that it, uh, the the material has reflected the infrared radiation so since now it is not showing the correct representation of the colors that's why we call it false color composite and there is a standard false color composite that you would have seen and that is uh, when we give red led the reflectance of visible uh, near infrared radiation uh, electromagnetic wave and we give the green led the reflectance from the red uh, red light and uh, when we give the blue led the reflectance value from the green light so when you do this you will get a different not natural looking kind of representation of your spectral image and in that the red portions sorry the red portions will highlight your vegetation because if you recall just a while back i showed and the vegetation has highest reflectance in the near infrared range so that's why uh, if you remember sir said that in the false color composite that he showed on this portion there was some red and he talked uh, he said that this is vegetation so this is the logic that is how that red is related to vegetation okay uh now let's look at some more uh, uh, yeah some more satellites we have so we have hiko the platform is hyperspectral image for coastal ocean image for coastal ocean it was commissioned from 2009 to 2014 the resolution the spectral no sorry the spatial resolution was coarse 90 meters to 90 meter and they it was also not having high number of bands so it 128 bands and the wavelength the range of uh, our electromagnetic spectrum that it covered was from 400 meters to 800 meters so not much just the visible and uh, near infrared range was covered so 
nanometer sorry to 800 nanometer and then temporal uh, the temporal resolution was 3 days so it uh, was revolving around our earth and uh, each point one point and on the earth surface it revisited in 3 days so it took 3 days to uh, revolve around the uh, its own axis so sorry the revolving revolving axis around the earth okay so that's all about eco then we have eco stress which can, this one can be important for us because this is a radiometer and the main function why it was used was to measure the increase in the temperature of leaves in a plant so when we water the plants what we basically what the plants basically use the most of the water is to cool down because plants are constantly getting hit by sunlight and they are using the energy they are absorbing the radiation and doing photosynthesis and uh, transport of nutrients and everything that they are doing in the process their temperature increases and to cool down they evaporate the water from their stomatal openings in case you are not watering your plants properly the stomata will close to pre prevent the water that is inside the plants because plants need some water to survive also within them and when the stomata close, closes and there is no evaporation then the temperature of your leaves increase or the plant as a whole increases so that is why this eco stress satellite uh, satellite was deployed and it is currently in the uh, space station uh, as what was told by in the lecture i don't know whether it is decommissioned now or not because this lectures are probably one or two years old so currently we don't know but that's the main purpose of the eco stress sensor so from 2018 they are used so what is the main function the temperature of plants growing in specific location on earth so when uh, so this also gives us a hint about the satellite right specific location on earth so this kind of uh, tells me that uh, uh, the data probably they are recording only for a certain location so even uh, since it is a uh, installed on the space station we cannot say that it is uh, geosynchronous because the space station is evolving at a different speed but uh, only certain locations it is absorbing the information okay so what is the uh, spatial resolution 70 meters and uh, it is having only six bands so this is a multi-spectral spectroscopy okay so as we said that uh, no just right that really, uh, this is basically uh, measuring indirectly the water stress okay and uh, one more thing so the temperature of plants anyhow will increase as more and more radiation comes but the well water plants will show slow increase in the temperature so you will have ground besides the plants or uh, in the next pixel to the plant pixel you will have ground so you can easily see the difference in the the temperature between the soil and the trees or, or the plants and you can identify whether they are properly watered or not the less the water the lesser the difference between the 
soil temperature and the planting. Okay. Now let's see some uh, hyperspectral airborne uh, sensors. So first we have, sorry, IVRIS. That is airborne, visible, and uh, infrared imaging spectrometer. And another one is PRISM. That is portable, remote, imaging spectrum so let's see uh, the iviris is now this uh, decommissioned in so sorry uh, the now new generation is coming but the old iviris the classic iviris had a swath of 614 pixels and simultaneously covered 224 bands which spanned over a uh, wavelength region from 400 nanometer to 2500 nanometer. So uh, it is actually when we say airborne that means that uh, they are installed in a plane or uh, in some other kind of low flying, not in satellites, some in other kind of uh, medium to low flying uh, instruments or planes only. And uh, they are used to measure the uh, reflectance from a particular given area. So this uh, ivory is uh, done locally. So it is, uh, as I said, it is not a satellite. So on only very uh, when you have uh, some uh, field data collection uh, campaign then only the planes are hired and the satellite uh, sensors are installed and they travel through the area covering the covering the whole area and getting the reflectance data for that particular uh, soil and land land management so that is why also we said the temporal resolution for spec uh, hyperspectral Spectroscopy is not uh, very high because most often than not they are done only for uh, only when the data is required for a particular site. So they are done for soil and crop management and the bandwidth is less than 10 nanometers. See the swath of 614 pixels. So we are not talking about uh, kilometers here. So this uh, the perpendicular to the movement, the number of pixels here are set 614. Okay. And the IVRIS next generation is going to be even better than this IVRIS, which is actually by considered the best till now the hyperspectral sensor so ivris ng uh, so the next generation is expected to have 5 nanometer wavelength band and it will span over a wavelength of 380 nanometer to 2510 nanometer okay now let's come to prism prism is basically used not for our not for our uh, specialization it is used for coral reef uh, checking the condition and the health of the coral reef Yeah, coral reef are in ocean. Yes, ocean application. Correct, Gulshan. So it is 
I have written above also. So yeah, let's just not write again here. It is done basically for coral reef health. Ocean application. And it is, it spans over a wavelength of 349.9 to 153.5 nanometer with a resolution or the bandwidth of each band of 3.5 nanometer okay now let's move to these are all the satellites now let's move to some concepts so how do these satellites or the sensors get the data so we move to sensor principle. So, so I forgot to talk about one important concept. Yeah, so we will cover this here only. So when you have these uh, bands, as we said, 200 bands, 224 bands, and one band is having this much nanometer. So what does that actually mean? is you have you will take the image same image or you will have the same matrix representing the same area but it will have reflectance value for 220 different wavelengths average wavelength so if one band is having a bandwidth of 5 nanometer so the average reflectance of in this 5 nanometer range will be there for 220 times. So if this is, a, to explain it more clearly, if this is your electromagnetic spectrum and you are, so this is increasing of wavelength and you have divided it in 5 nanometer wave band. So this is one band. So the average reflectance of from this material, from a material on the ground, over this 5 nanometer band will be stored in first this first this matrix then the second matrix will be having the average reflectance for the second band the third will be on the third so it will be a set of matrix and that is how the image cube that sir talked about is created so you have same image of uh, like a image of a same area but taken with different different wavelength of light now how do we get there are two ways to get the image of one area for one wavelength so how do we get this 2d first so there are two ways first you can either uh, take the image directly for this 2d at one go you take the image of the whole ground and you store it in a matrix or you can and then you do this uh, subsequently for different different wavelengths and that's how you uh, stack the matrix into a 3d image cube so once you make uh, one for one wavelength you take the image for another wavelength you take the image and that's how you stack it that is one procedure another procedure is you go to one pixel you go to one pixel and you get the information or the reflectance for all the wave bands for this particular one pixel and then you go to another pixel and then you get the reflectance for all the other wave bands that is also one of the ways you can make the 3D image cube. Now this procedure of uh, making the cube not by stacking the matrix on top of each other actually is also said is divided into two, two ways. One is whisk brown method also called as spotlight another one is push broom 
also called as a long track scanner so what is this whisk brown so consider that this is the swath this is the area you are covering let's make it a little bit tilted also and as you go in this direction as your plane flies in this direction you are getting the reading for this ground and storing it in the matrix that i have shown here in whisk brown we use a mirror to focus the radiation or the reflectance from some place in the ground only one given place in the ground to our sensor and then we rotate the mirror and then we focus on the other place on the ground then to our sensor and then the third so it is like rotating your broom so if i yeah if i want to draw the broom it is like rotating your broom left and right and getting the data so you are just go like rotate here then here then here then here then here so like this you get for each uh each column and you swipe around the rows so this is how you make uh, the 3d uh, image cube another way is you look at the ground at once so you focus on this so you are uh, again flying in this direction and then you focus on this region directly at once and then when you move forward you focus on this region so this is like push broom so you have a broom that covers the whole swath and then you are pushing it along the flight direction so there is no uh, need of mirror in this case in this case we need the mirror because we cannot uh, rotate our plane like this so we need a mirror to rotate and get the reflectance of one point at a time okay yeah so then uh, so then when we have this image queue still before we are able to do the false color composite the, all the papers that sir has discussed there are a lot of corrections that are needed to be done see when you uh, look at the earth it looks flat but when you look at it from the satellite or from a distance even you cannot see the horizon because of the earth's uh, curvature so when you take a photo from a satellite it is going to be distorted so you have to align it so these are the pre processing of the data so the level 1 radiance the level 2 surface reflection that sir talked about and then the atmospheric correction the most important so uh, and also in when you are taking this flight and getting the data see you will not be having this kind of an image what you will initially have if you have a correct pictorial representation you will have something like this if you correctly plot them then you have to align them may make some extra readings here and then align them or then make a tangent or a parallelogram kind of shape then there may be cloud cover so what happens is your satellite is above the cloud level and you are getting the reflectance of the solar radiation so you may not the, the reflected rays may not be able to get to your sensor itself right so that is also one of the possibility so there are some standard methods to remove this cloud cover then uh, as sir discussed in atmospheric correction so the irradiance coming from the sun is get is gets absorbed 
some of the intensity gets absorbed in the object that we are interested in and in the downfalling i uh, yeah, i don't understand this downfalling wilson uh, care to speak you can speak no no issues you can unmute and you can speak <laughs> okay no issue so there is a downfall of the intensity probably that's what pollution is trying to say so then it is uh, yeah the coming from the sun down falling from the sun because uh, we do uh, passive uh, spectroscopy so then uh, and then the radiance that is coming from the source background noise here sir sorry for the no 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 problem no issues see we uh, we interact more i'll be more happy yeah so then we have radiance that is reflected back so these can be absorbed from the dust particles in the atmosphere then these can be blocked from the cloud directly hold totally itself so these are all uh, some of the data pre processing or data checks that we have to do and very nice image uh, sir showed of uh, a removal of this uh, haze effect from the image so that's also one of the examples of data sorry uh, atmospheric correction so we will not go much into that detail there are papers that uh, talk about how to do cloud removal also so what they do is basically i'll just uh, touch upon it a little because i find it very fascinating that they have an image with cloud cover so basically this image is not useful anymore but what they do is they find the image of the area probably uh, some time back when the cloud was not there and they extract the points from here and replace it here and then uh, assign the intensity using some kind of machine learning algorithm assign the intensity to these points using some kind of machine learning algorithm or some other algorithm uh, analytical expressions so that's quite fascinating that also comes under atmospheric correction okay yeah so then we had uh, the sir discussed about the case studies so basically i'll summarize about the main case study that was done to get the nitrogen content using the hyperspectral so what they did what was discussed in the paper was they went to some 30 or so sites got the leaves and then performed experiments and got the nitrogen content then to this similar sites or the same location where they got the leaves from they went and they performed the spectral uh, spectroscopy they got the reflectance data for different different wavelengths and they tried to identify the region in the electromagnetic wave band which can be correlated nicely with the uh, nitrogen content in the particular leaf or in the particular area what they found was they did uh, they used a lot of methods as uh, pca that is our principal component analysis the db scan the density based uh, kind of uh, clustering and uh, hierarchical clustering and then random forest and all of these techniques uh, pointed out that the best wave band or the wave band that is most suitable for uh, correlating with the nitrogen content is the red edge so what is this red edge so when we look at this uh, reflectance plot for the vegetation we see this sorry we see some kind of 
this kind of block where this is reflectance this is reflectance and this is wavelength and this steep edge that uh, we see here it is partly by uh, partly in the range of red light and partly in the range of near infrared light so how does this relate to chlorophyll the plants uh, the chlorophyll sorry how does this relate to nitrogen content see the nitrogen content the significance of the nitrogen content is in the chlorophyll which absorbs the red light see the chlorophyll is responsible for photosynthesis like uh, co2 assimilation and that is uh, the extent or the amount of co2 fixation it can do is directly proportional to the nitrogen content so this red light is absorbed in the chlorophyll so that is how this uh, red is becoming significant and this leaf internal or the uh, internal space is responsible for the scattering of this near infrared rays so uh, you can say that the red portion is kind of signifying the amount or the healthy the extent of the nitrogen and this near nir is uh, amounting for the um, uh, the extent of the leaf the amount of leaf the coverage so that is how they are able to get these two bands are able to explain most of the variability observed in the nitrogen content so for more detail you can go ahead and read this paper yeah so that is all that i want to discuss for this uh, week and now i want to show you guys that uh, i that i promised uh, last time or uh, some uh, previous to previous week that when we have a bigger theory course then a theory week then we will go and see example of deep learning in matlab so let's do that so let me share my screen and let's look at the deep learning give me a second so how do i do this should move this here okay 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 So, so, so. Okay, speak through this mic only. Let me share my screen. Okay, I hope the different screen is visible right now. It, it is visible. Okay. Are you able to screen? Ah, uh, oh, sorry. Are you able to see the Jupyter notebook that I have opened? okay okay sorry about that let me share it again i am not sure why i am not able to do this this is surprising Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, now you should be able to see. 
Yeah, no, I have actually two monitors, so I was by mistake presenting the different monitor. So let me zoom in a little. So basically, I am also not very uh, the expert of machine learning, you can say, because the IIT Madras, in IIT Madras, uh, there was a competition where uh, by conducted by ocean engineer ocean engineering students where they gave us a data set and i thought it would be very good for our exercise so i participated in that and uh, we have to uh, let me turn it again yeah and uh, we have to fit a machine learning model a deep deep neural network and uh, get one column from the other 10 columns so so I'm just here uh, connecting my this collab. This is collab online Jupyter notebook. So I need to connect it to my Google Drive. So this is the cell that does that. And this is where my files are stored. So I have to give this uh, specify the folder. And now I am just importing some uh, pandas and numpy. You should be familiar with it if you have worked in Python. And this is uh, to split my data into training and test. And this is the train.csv is the file that they provided us for training. So I'll just load it, load the data, and I have used print data to print. So the first six columns were, uh, first five columns were not useful. So I have omitted them and I have just shown you the data that is going to be used in the machine learning. So we have wind direction, then wind speed, and some other values. And using all these values, we have to predict train our model to be able to predict the wave height in meters. So this last column is something that is our dependent variable. And these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. These 10 are, are our features. So let's see how we train our model. So I have stored the thing into the data frame called data. Now I split my data into training and testing examples. So we use this train test split inbuilt function that is inside the scikit-learn library, scikit-learn.sklearn.model selection import train test split. Yes, and I have given a 0.1 test size. That means 10% of my data should be used for the testing purpose and the 90% should be used for the training purpose. So this, this is going to split it into train and uh, test and train. Now I need to separate my independent, sorry, dependent variable y and independent variable x for both the training and testing. So I use this. So basically this uh, train dot i log uh, column minus one basically says that you take this last column and give it to y train. And similarly, I'm doing for the test also. So I'll just run this. Now I have a x train. You know, I can show this here. So if you just do print x train, you will see that I have the 10 features and the wave height is not there. The wave height is in y train. Here is the wave height. Okay, so we have uh, split our data and then separated the features and the dependent variable. Okay, now let's. Uh, import our Kira. So for this deep learning, I'm not going to hard code the deep learning and get perform all the operations. We'll just directly import. People have done very good work and they have made some libraries. We'll just import it. So Kira is the library which uh, you can use for training your uh, deep neural network. So I import Kira's sequential and dense for deep neural network. And I initialize my model here and I give it. So uh, now there is the model setup. So I add one layer of neurons into my model, which will have five nodes and the activation function for these neurons will be ReLU. I can change it to sigmoid. I can change it to uh, leaky ReLU. I can change it to 10H, all the functions, there's uh, activation functions that are discussed in class. And then we have our input dimension. So since we have 10 features with us, so we need to give the input dimension as 10. 
and then uh, the weights if you remember what we basically do in machine learning is we train the connections between the nodes that are basically set weights and we need to initialize them so you i have here initialized them as random uniform you can initialize them by random normal or some other initialization you can initialize them by zeros values also but that is not uh, very advisable so i have added so we have first our input layer with 10 nodes then we have our uh, second hidden first hidden layer with five nodes and for to make it uh, just the deep neural network i have added another hidden layer after the first hidden layer with another five nodes you can change these values to 5 6 any integer value so now we have one input layer and then five uh, five nodes for hidden layer and then another another five nodes for hidden layer and since our output for these 10 values if you see we have one output so we need one node for the output layer and that's what i have done here for simplicity i have kept the activation function and uh, the initialization of the weights as same so now we run this now our model is set now what we have to do we have to train our model to train our model we need to tell it few things that what is the optimizer it is going to use like which is the function what is the way uh, using which it is going to optimize the weights and what is the function which uh, which it will use to kind of uh, calculate the loss of our model so i we have used mean square error a very simple we can uh, we all know what is mean square error and sgd the optimizer is basically standard gradient descent so you must be familiar that uh, with the gradient descent by now this is just basically differentiation so you just differentiate the last function with the weights and you do so for all the weights and then you slowly slowly uh, minimize the loss and get the value of the weights that gives the minimum loss and his uh, here is here is uh, where we tell our model that this is how you are going to optimize and this is the line which basically performs the training so we give the x train we give the y train and uh, now i want uh, your prompt response who can tell me what is this batch size and what is this epoch i have talked about it in last session in recurrent net neural network but it is uh, this can be the concept is same for both deep learning and recurrent neural network what do you guys think this batch sizes and uh, epoch is okay so if you recall i said when we have huge data and in this case we don't have huge data we have basically just only 3886 data points because the index starts from zero so we have 3886 data points but when we have very huge data then you cannot just uh, compute the loss and train your model with the all the data in one go so what do you do you divide your data into batch and this is the batch size so what uh, how many values will be there in your how many data points will be there in your each batch and then epochi is how many number of times you want to train your model Uh, with the entire data so you go through your data once or you go through all your data once and you get some uh, value for your weights you get some value for your uh, w matrix and you get so, some value for your biases but it is not the exact value so what you do you go through your data again and then 
optimize the value of the weights and biases further. So the number of times you go through your data again and again is written as epoch. So I have written here 30 number of times I want to go through my data and uh, I want to optimize my function. We, we can have more also, but what happens when you do very high number of epoches, you are overfitting your model to your training example. Right? So this is the thing. Now let's uh, in our model. I have given 30 um, for one more reason so that it is fast. So you observe this after every push, it is giving us loss value. And do you see the loss value changing? No. See, after initialization, what was our loss? We have we have the same loss now also. So where are we going wrong? See, even after 30 times going through our data, we couldn't reduce the loss. And this will not be called a, a, well, a kind of calibrated or validated model because we have not, not trained our model. Basically, it is same as the initial. So what do you guys think I have missed uh, in doing all these things? I will show you the data and then maybe if you have done some machine learning, you will be able to tell me what I have missed before training the data. I should have done something to this data before training. Give it a shot. If you uh, do incorrectly, it will help you remember it more clearly. Okay. So I will, do you guys recall something called standardization of the data? Anyone? Yes or no? Do you guys recall standardization of the data? We talked about it. Okay, so maybe you can, uh, yeah, so good. Okay, so you now understand. Okay, so basically, these values are in 100, these values are in tens, then again 100, and these values are in thousands. So your uh, plot, if I were to plot a 10 dimensional plot and get the value of, uh, and this value is in decimals, then it will not be spanning uniformly. What is the difference between initialization and standardization? Okay. So initialization we are doing for the parameters, for the weights. And standardization is something we do to the input values. Yeah. So when we do standardization, what we do is basically we divide this data, uh, all this data by mean value. Uh, sorry, we do the minus mean divided by standard deviation. Right? So that we uh, make the mean of the feature, all these features as uh, zero and standard deviation as one. Similarly, we do this for uh, the, all the features. So that it is kind of a uniform grid we have. And in that case, the standard gradient descent can easily go to the local minima. So let's do that and see if we are getting any improvement. So here is our uh, training and test data finalization. So let's do this here. So I have here, uh, I have kept it here below. Let me just copy paste it. This is our standardization of the data. So the conventional standardization will have one more thing. So NumPy is a very nice library. You can actually get the standard deviation of all the 10 features separately uh, if by using just one command. And uh, how we do standardization? We do this. I will, uh, I will come back to why I had shifted uh, this. Uh, normal standardization to a uh, different approach. 
from that to that. So this is our standardization. Subtract all the values with the mean of this particular feature, and then we divide all the the remaining thing with the standard deviation. And this is expected. So let's let's do this. Let's uh, actually print the value of uh, mean and standard deviation of these features as they are now. So let's. Okay, so let's run this. You will see that uh, the direction, wind direction, wind speed, and then the pressure, they all have this mean and this standard deviation. Now, after I do this operation, let's see what is the mean and standard deviation. So I have run this. Now I again compute the mean and standard deviation of the modified train and test. Let's see what we get. Here you see the mean is very close to zero, and the standard deviation is one. So this is uh, what I am. Uh, I was talking about standardizing the data. Okay, now let's see if our model is able to give any better results or not. So previously we were getting 0.5 uh, mean square error as a loss. So let's see if we get something better. so we initially we have big higher loss and we keep on having higher loss right instead uh, at least previously we were having 0.5 now we have uh, instead of 0.5 we have 1 so that's then that means we cannot use the con conventional standardization process in this approach and that is why i had put a non conventional standardization that i will show you right now it is a um, machine learning model is this uh, gradient descent it is very sensitive to the values so if you you will see these things will not change by much but how greatly it is going to affect our machine learning model so now let's do this new kind of standardization and let's see the new mean and the new standard deviation standard deviation is close to 0.5 mean is 1 because i have divided the values by the mean okay now let's train our for safety i will just reimport the keyers uh, reinitialize the model and recompile the training you see our loss immediately has decreased to 0.3 starting itself it has reduced and just after 6 epochi it has gone to 0.09 also so we are having much better uh, training right by 30 epochi probably we will go to 0.02 mean square error oh so we went to 0.03 but from 0.5 to 0.03 it may not look much right now but you need to uh, do a lot of uh, you need to know a lot of machine learning actually to uh, increase the accuracy of your model by even a slight decimal see the in the competition i just uh, wanted to check what is my uh, what is the accuracy of my model compared to others so the best i could get was 0.009 and people there were having 0.006 not much difference right but for the life of me i could not figure out how to get the model better accurate i was unable to increase the model of my, my model accuracy beyond this so there are people uh, you know uh, machine learning is a vast topic and then there are a lot of things that lot of people don't know and i am also one of them so we have trained our model but we need to know whether this model is correct or not so we have to perform this validation or testing so for that we'll use our test data so we'll use the model and we'll use the test data and to get the predicted value we can use model dot predict and you can get the value of y predict this is just to change the format of the output that we get you no need to worry about 
so this is y predict and i use this y predict to get to measure the mean square error with the y test that uh, we initially had so what is the difference between the test and the predicted value and what is the mean square error that uh, we are going to get let's see so it should be close to this loss then only we can say our model is uh, trained nicely if you see our uh, loss is uh, even lesser than this so it is point, uh, 0 0.02507 mean square error so we can successfully say that we have trained our model nicely so this is uh, something that i was uh, uh, i wanted to show you so uh, this is uh, deep learning now you can play with the value you can uh, remove this one layer and comment this line remove this one layer train it with one hidden layer only so it is not deep neural network now it is just shallow neural network you can increase the number of layers by copy pasting just copy paste and you can increase the number of layers now it is a three hidden layer deep neural network so you can do play around with the thing so I'm going to share this uh, lab notebook with you guys. Preferably you run this uh, on Colab, not on your system, because it will take much time and probably it may not even run. Right? So, yeah. So that's all for uh, today's session. If you have any questions, then you can ask now. Okay, so thanks for joining in today's session and uh, I'll, end it, I'll end the session now.